All right. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is Galen Barbos, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, thanks for, for joining the webinar today, where uh, I'll be sharing some of the highlights from uh, the latest edition of our annual report tracking the status of state renewable portfolio and clean electricity standards in the U.S. Um, I'm joined here by my, my colleague and, and special guest, Eric O'Shaughnessy. Um, Eric's formal responsibilities here are to help run the Q&A and also to serve as a backup in case my internet drops out as it has been doing this morning. Um, but I, I also asked Eric to join because in, in one of his other hats uh, as a consultant to the National Renewable Energy Lab, he, he leads up their annual report on the U.S. voluntary green power market, which is kind of a natural complement to, to the uh, annual RPS report that I'll be talking about. So um, if, if there are questions on, on the voluntary market that come up in the q and I'll, I'll be happy to, to defer to Eric on those. Um, before getting started, I'll just run through the, the standard set of housekeeping items here. Uh, number one is this webinar is being recorded and we'll, we'll post uh, a recording of the webinar uh, online within the next uh, couple days, uh, usually within 24 hours, it gets gets posted up there. Um, second is that uh, we will have time for Q&A at the end, hopefully a good 15, 20 minutes if I'm quick in getting through the slides. Um, I would just ask that all of you, as, as we proceed through the webinar, if you have questions along the way, please enter them in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, and Eric will be in the background organizing those and getting them ready for the session at the end. And ho hopefully we can get through as many as we can. Um, and then lastly, I'll just point you all to the, the URL at the bottom of the screen here, rps.lbl.gov. Uh, this is the website where we post the report, um, uh, as well as a variety of supporting spreadsheets. Um, it's also where the webinar will ultimately get posted. Um, so I definitely encourage you to, to check that out if you haven't already done so. Uh, I, I lastly just mentioned that the report, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, is a, a PowerPoint deck. Um, and the, the slides that I'll be running through here today are, are largely just an abbreviated version of that deck. So um, I, I'm not expecting to post the webinar slides per se, uh, but the report itself uh, is essentially that the set of slides that we'll be going through. Uh, so with that, let's let's begin. Uh, so uh, these are the topics that I'll, I'll quickly run through, kind of starting with a quick summary of kind of where we are today, uh, where RPS and CES programs exist, how those policies have impacted uh, renewable development so far, and, and how much additional renewables and clean electricity we might need to meet those, those targets going forward. Uh, we'll look at how well states have performed in hitting their targets so far, pricing trends for renewable energy certificates, um, and related to that, uh, what the cost has been of, of meeting these targets so far. And then I'll conclude with a few, a few kind of uh, uh, comment, comments related to the outlook of these policies going forward. Uh, again, just mentioned at the bottom of the screen here are, is the, the RPS website uh, where we have the report as well as a couple different sets of, of spreadsheet uh, data. So first, uh, we'll just look at kind of where these policies exist today. There are 29 states plus the District of Columbia that have some sort of mandatory RPS um, with varying targets, as you can see here. Uh, 16 of these 30 jurisdictions have RPS targets at or above 50% of retail sales. Um, not necessarily currently, but, but that's the target that they are ultimately um, uh, aiming for. Uh, and then four states uh, currently have 100% RPS targets. Uh, in addition to those four states with 100% RPS targets, there are 16 states that have some broader 100% clean electricity standard. Um, and the distinguishing feature of a CES um, is that it is open to a broader range of technologies than an RPS, typically also uh, allows nuclear, carbon capture, sequestration, and, and large hydroelectric generation, which often is not eligible for an RPS. 
Um, so there are 16 states that have uh, adopted some form of 100% CES policy. Um, as you can see, with the sole exception of Nebraska, all of these 100% CES states also have an RPS. And, and, and so these, these CES policies, they very much are intended to serve as kind of an extension of or a follow on to their RPS. Um, the timeline here shows uh, just the, the years in which states have enacted their RPS policies. That's shown in blue above, above the timeline here. And you can see most of these policies have been around for a long time, uh, at least 10 years, um, in many cases, 20 years or more. So these, these are long-lived policies. Um, more recently, though, you can see on the upper right-hand side, the slate of states that have enacted 100% CES uh, targets. And so those are, those are much more recent policies. Um, in some cases, we, we refer to those as kind of the next generation of state RPS programs. And those, those are all much more recent, typically enacted within the past uh, five or six years or so. Um, and then lastly, below the timeline, you can just see in each year which states made some sort of significant revision to their RPS uh, or CES. Um, and those revisions um, have, have tapered off a bit in the last few years, but certainly there have been some significant changes that have been made even in those past few years. Um, uh, with respect to, to those recent uh, changes to RPS and CES programs, uh, there were about 100 uh, bills introduced in state legislature, le legislatures over the past year and a half um, that have sought to make some change to the RPS program. Um, the, uh, a, a small fraction of those, about 10%, were actually enacted. Um, and of those enacted bills, um, all of them either strengthened the RPS or CES in some way, or in many cases made relatively neutral kind of technical changes to the program. Um, among the more significant uh, changes that strengthened RPSs or CESs, uh, Vermont uh, raised their RPS to 100% just this year. Um, Michigan and Minnesota also both recently raised their RPS while at the same time creating new 100% CES uh, targets. Uh, so with that, let's, let's kind of look at historically what sort of effects these, these policies have had on renewable energy development. Um, and I'll start out just by kind of stating the obvious, which is that um, renewable energy growth in the U.S. is the result of a great many different factors um, that have all kind of contributed to the expansion of renewable energy over the past uh, several decades. Um, RPS policies are, uh, of course, a very important part of, of that, that kind of broader landscape, um, but it's by no means the only game in town. And it is quite difficult, if not impossible, to precisely separate out the effects of RPS programs from these many other important drivers that have also uh, taken place over the past uh, several decades. And so uh, within this report, we, we don't attempt to do any uh, kind of precise attribution but I'll just present some indica indicative data on the next couple slides that helps to just sort of paint a picture and, and provide a, a rough sense of kind of the order of magnitude impact that these policies have potentially had. Um, and there are a couple different ways of doing this. Um, the, perhaps the most basic is to just compare actual growth in renewable energy uh, over, over time, that's the red line here, to the minimum amount of growth that needed to occur simply to meet RPS programs. And so you can see that you know, total growth in renewable generation since the year 2000 is about 650 terawatt hours. RPS and CES policies together required about 280 terawatt hours, so a little over 40% of that total. Um, as I said, this is not precise attribution. Some of those 280 terawatt hours would have happened even in the absence of a, a mandate. Um, but by the same token, RPS policies, by virtue of creating kind of this, this stable source of demand and kind of a foundation for the industry to grow around, have provided the basis for a lot of the renewable growth that we've seen outside of RPS programs as well. And so there is kind of both some spillover effect as well as um, as well as, as, as perhaps some 
free ridership as, as, as um, it might sometimes be called. Um, so this is kind of the national picture here. This slide shows the same data, but just broken out by region, um, where we again compare actual growth in renewable generation to the, the minimum amount required to meet RPS targets. Um, you can see for the two regions on the left-hand side, the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic, um, uh, that the actual growth actually has, has lagged the requirements. Um, that difference has been made up in many cases by imports. Um, but the more significant kind of point here is, is just that um, given, given what we see in those regions, it, it is reasonable to expect that RPS programs have been an important driver for renewable growth there. Um, in the West, you can see that actual growth has exceeded RPS requirements, though most of that surplus or a good portion of it uh, consists of net metered PV that, that um, generally isn't eligible for, or isn't used for RPS programs. Um, but the, the vast majority of the growth in um, utility scale renewables within the West is, is being used to meet RPS uh, requirements. Um, and then in Texas in the Midwest, you can see that actual growth has really far exceeded um, the requirements of RPS programs in those regions. And, and that uh, really reflects both kind of the modest requirements as well as the very favorable economics for renewable energy in, in those regions. Um, now, another way of looking at this, it, rather than looking at renewable energy generation is to look at new renewable capacity that's being built each year and kind of who's taking the power from those projects and what are they doing with it? Are they using it for RPS compliance uh, or for some other purpose? Um, and the figure here just breaks out renewable capacity additions each year in terms of the off taker. Um, uh, utilities and power marketers are the, the largest of the different off taker categories here. Uh, but you can see that, that retail off takers consisting of corporate PPAs and community solar have been um, growing significantly in their share of new builds each year, uh, particularly over the past four years or so. Um, and in addition, on-site projects, primarily behind the meter PV, um, are also a, a quite significant share of, of new renewable builds each year, um, about a quarter of the total last year. Um, now, within each of those off-taker categories, some of the renewable capacity and some of the reps um, may be getting used for RPS compliance, and, and some portion is, is being used for other purposes. Um, we, within this report, have kind of a semi-elaborate scheme for, for estimating or making some determination as to whether any individual project is being used for RPS purposes or not. Um, the percentages here show based on, on that scheme, what fraction of uh, capacity contracted to each of these different entities is, is ultimately being used for RPS purposes. Um, and so you can see, you know, across the board, some, some fraction within each of those categories is uh, ultimately kind of flowing into RPS markets. Um, and then this figure here just kind of adds that up all up and shows on an annual basis what portion of the, the new renewable capacity being built is being used for RPS purposes. Uh, the, the solid blue bar segments show that RPS total in gigawatt terms. Um, those numbers have generally been going up over time, uh, indicating that RPS programs continue to be a strong driver for renewable capacity additions. Um, however, the, the red line, which just shows the RPS percentage of the total, um, has declined over time, whereas you know, 10 years ago or so, maybe 60-70% of renewable capacity additions were being used for RPS purposes. Now that, that percentage is, is closer to a third. Um, and that you know, doesn't reflect any drop in kind of the absolute amount of capacity being used for RPSs, but rather reflects the really um, a dramatic growth in RPS capacity additions occurring outside of RPS markets, kind of the polka dotted sections in, in, the, in the bar charts here. And those non-RPS capacity additions last year were split in roughly equal parts between retail off-takers, again, consisting of corporate PPAs and community solar, 
on-site solar, primarily behind the meter PV, um, and utilities and power marketers who are purchasing renewables outside of RPS states, um, presumably because of the, just the, the economics of those resources. Um, so that's kind of the past. Looking now to the future, um, we can look at kind of how much additional renewable capacity and renewable generation might be needed in order to meet the, the growing requirements under RPS and CES programs. Um, and so to begin, let's just kind of look at the, the size of the targets. Uh, the, this bubble chart here, each circle shows the, um, the, um, the, the maximum percentage target that each state is ramping up to. Uh, that's along the y-axis. And then the x-axis is the, the year by which that, that target must be met. Um, and I think the, the main point here is that we can kind of think about these states in a few different groups. If you look at just the, the, the blue circles, the RPS targets, uh, you can see in the lower left-hand quadrant, this cluster of states that are all essentially kind of these legacy RPS programs with relatively modest percentage targets. In many cases, those final target years that have, have come and gone. And so those policies, even though they're, they're still on the books, they're not really driving much additional um, renewable energy demand. Um, you've then got this big cluster of circles, blue circles in the middle of the chart. These are states with more aggressive, typically 50% or more RPS targets um, and with, with timeframes around 2030 or so. Um, and then the third RPS contingent are, are states that have similarly high targets, but somewhat longer timelines, maybe out to 2040 or 2050. Um, you then got uh, the yellow circles, the, the CES targets. Um, as I mentioned, these are mostly in states that also have RPS programs. And in most cases, um, states that have relatively aggressive RPS targets as well. Um, and you can see that based on the, the dashed blue circles. Um, you can also see here that these CES targets are, are in most cases, long-term targets. These are targets that, that need to be met um, often by 2050, in some cases by 2040, but these are much longer term targets. Uh, this figure here, which is a, a little bit sort of odd and can take some time to, to comprehend, is really just intended to show the time frame over which the RPS policies and the CES policies are ramping up. Um, and we show this here just for the states that have CESs. And there are a couple points that I wanted to just stress here. First is that um, there's often a gap between the end of a state's RPS trajectory and when the CES targets kick in. Um, the other point is that these CES targets often, um, they don't typically ramp up uh, year by year in the way that RPS targets typically do. In fact, many of these CES policies consist of just a single target for some distant out year, 2040 or 2050. Others might have kind of a bookend set of targets where they'll have a percentage CES requirement for some earlier year and then another target for a later year, but without any kind of really defined um, ramp up over the intervening years. Um, and that to some extent just reflects the, the state of evolution in these CES policies. There, you know, these have been passed by legislation but in many cases, um, kind of the, many of the kind of administrative and regulatory details, the implementation details haven't been fully fleshed out yet. So when we take those percentage targets and translate them to terawatt hours, um, here's what they look like over time. So this, this shows the total demand for clean energy under RPS and CES programs, basically the amount of renewable energy or RECs that will be needed in each year uh, to meet those requirements. Um, and you can see that those totals growing over time. Um, in the case of the RPS portion, um, after 2030, the, the growth in RPS demand is primarily being driven by just underlying load growth. The percentage targets aren't growing much. And so it's really just keeping up with, with the load growth. Um, the CES uh, targets, those really start kicking in around 2030. Um, you can see kind of this very lumpy shape here, which just reflects that kind of 
staggered structure to the targets that I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, of course, you know, actual growth and supply will be will be smoother. Uh, but this gives you some sense of just how much uh, uh, um, total demand will grow over time uh, from about 500 terawatt hours today to um, maybe 1700 or so terawatt hours out by 2050. Uh, so this is total demand. Um, some of that demand will be met by existing sources of supply, um, and some of that demand will require new, new supply. Um, and in the chart here, we've, we've tried to estimate how much of future demand under these policies um, will be met by existing versus new supplies. Um, and so you can see in the case of the RPS targets, um, most of the incremental demand growth will, will require uh, so will require new new RPS supplies, new clean electricity supplies. Um, for the CES programs, in contrast, uh, about half of the growth in demand um, can be met, and, and I would say likely will be met by existing resources. And those existing resources are primarily existing nuclear and large hydro resources. Um, whether or not those, those facilities um, are around to meet CES demand in 2050, it certainly depends on, on relicensing, um, but at least based on eligibility rules, um, the, those resources um, would and could count. Um, now, there are a couple important factors uh, that we haven't accounted for here, uh, kind of wild, wild card factors to keep in mind. Um, one is interregional transmission. Um, currently, there's a lot of um, renewable capacity, existing renewable generation in the Midwest and in Texas and other parts of the country that um, is uh, kind of locked out of RPS markets as a result of, of, of insufficient transmission. And so new interregional transmission may unlock some of that existing supply um, and potentially uh, reduce the amount of new supply that might be needed to meet uh, demand growth under these policies. Um, working in the opposite direction um, is uh, potential retirement of existing renewable and clean electricity resources. You know, especially looking out to 2050, there's you know a substantial fraction of the existing base of solar and wind projects maybe reaching the end of their their life by that time, and so um, we're not accounting for that here. And so certainly some of what we're showing is existing resources may, may retire by that point and will need to be replaced. Um, and then lastly, I also mentioned the voluntary market, which um, you know, may, may end up absorbing a larger portion of the uh, existing uh, RPS eligible supply than what we've assumed here. And if so, that would then um, uh, imply larger kind of residual need for, for, for future demand growth. Um, so looking just at the, the, the new supply needs and how those are broken out across the country, the uh, figure here shows that it's, you know, pretty, pretty sort of even split across the six different regions here um, in terms of uh, the, the amount of new uh, clean electricity generation needed to meet RPS and CES demand growth. Uh, and there's a bit of commentary here that I, I, I won't go into here, but um, feel free to check out the report for, for some of those details. Uh, now, one important factor, particularly along the, the eastern seashore, is many of the RPS states uh, along the east coast have offshore wind targets. Uh, many also have solar carve-outs. And these, these offshore wind targets and solar carve-outs uh, could meet a, a quite significant portion of the incremental clean electricity needs under the RPS and CES targets in those regions. And you can see that in the charts here, the one on the top focuses on the Northeast, uh, the one in the bottom on, on the Mid-Atlantic. Um, and you can see that you know, the residual needs beyond the, uh, the, the offshore wind targets and solar carve-outs um, it, it fluctuates a bit from year to year, um, but there are years when, when very little additional um, supplies are needed beyond what, what those, those technology-specific carve-outs uh, will, will require. 
Um, and so there are a couple of different implications of that. One is obviously that um, the pace of development of, of new offshore wind capacity um, is going to really have a, a huge impact on how much additional renewables are needed to meet RPS and CES policies throughout these regions and, and when those resources will be needed. Um, there's also the possibility for pretty significant swings in REC prices as these, these large um, projects come online and we can potentially see periods of, of you know, significant surplus or deficit depending on the specific timing of when, when those projects come online. Uh, so I'm going to now kind of turn our attention back to the past um, and we're going to look at some compliance data um, to get some sense of how, how well uh, these, uh, how well states have performed in, in meeting the, these policies so far. Um, so the, the figure here, it, it focuses on compliance data for the most recent available year. Um, in some cases, 22, 20, 2022, 2023, uh, in, in for most of these states. Uh, the total height of the bar for each state shows the, the RPS target in that year. Uh, in most states, somewhere in the range of, say, 15 to 30 percent. Um, and then we show what, what fraction of that overall target was met with rec retirements or renewable energy. Um, and, and what, what portion was, was not met, the shortfall. Um, and so you can see looking across the states, most had pretty minor shortfalls. Um, there were a couple states with, with relatively larger shortfalls, um, New York and Illinois, for example. Um, in both of those cases, the shortfalls will um, be closed as, as soon as um, the, uh, much of the uh, uh, capacity that's currently under development comes online. Um, in Delaware, uh, we saw really for the first time a significant shortfall crop up, um, and that's the result of, of something that we'll look at in more detail in a couple slides, but within the mid-Atlantic, mid we're, we're beginning to see supplies for RPS, uh, the RPS tighten, and as that happens, states that have low alternative compliance payment rates um, are starting to see shortfalls as RECs are, are flowing kind of disproportionately into states with higher ACPs and that, that can support higher REC prices. Um, and we'll see that in, in more detail on some of the later slides, but the, these results here that we're seeing for Delaware are, are kind of a, a foreshadowing of things to come as supplies through the mid-Atlantic uh, tighten in the years ahead. Um, here we show kind of the same thing, but focusing on solar carve-outs. Again, most states um, have, have met these carve-out requirements, though there are uh, shortfalls in, in several states, uh, really for kind of a, a, a diverse set of mostly kind of state-specific reasons. Um, so the last section here, we're going to look at, at rep pricing trends and related to that, uh, the compliance costs associated with, with meeting RPS and CES targets. So first looking at REC prices, here we show uh, recent trends in uh, REC prices for what we call primary tier RECs uh, in New England uh, in the top figure and in the mid-Atlantic uh, in the bottom figure. Uh, Looking first at, at the, the New England class one, one reps on the top, you can see that prices over the past few years have been pretty flat, up around $40 per megawatt hour. That's essentially you know, right at or below the ACP rate um, in Massachusetts and Connecticut, and it's just a signal of kind of perennially tight markets there um, with a tight, tight balance between supply of class one RECs and, and demand. Um, in the figure on the bottom where we show trends for tier one REC prices in, in PJM, uh, you can see uh, over the past three or four years, a very steady, consistent increase in REC prices. Um, and that, that continued increase reflects a continued tightening in supplies throughout the region 
um, as, as um, interconnection delays and, and other factors are kind of slowing the pace of new builds um, and preventing the growth and supply from keeping pace with, with the growth in, in the targets throughout the region. Um, and as a result of that, we, we're starting to see, as I mentioned, uh, shortfalls in some of the states in the region that have low ACP rates. Delaware, as I mentioned, Maryland, we're starting to see the same thing. Um, and this, as, as I said, reflects the fact that RECs are shifting to those states with, with higher ACPs that can support higher, higher REC prices. Uh, here we show uh, recent uh, REC pricing trends for uh, SREC, Solar Renewable Energy Certificates, um, in, in those states with, with SREC markets. Um, there hasn't been a lot of movement uh, over time, at least in recent years. The main point that I wanted to just stress here is that there are particular states with especially high SREC prices, DC, uh, Massachusetts, and, and New Jersey in, in particular. Um, and, and that is important as we then turn to the next slide where we look at, at compliance costs. So uh, compliance costs, the, the kind of the concept of compliance costs as, as, we, as we use it within this report uh, is intended to reflect the kind of the, the incremental cost associated with meeting the RPS target in each state. And in retail choice states where compliance is primarily met through unbundled renewable energy certificates, we calculate compliance costs um, primarily by just looking at the price of RECs and the volume of RECs and multiplying those two things together. Um, it, it, there are some additional wrinkles in some states, but that is essentially what we're doing there. Um, in vertically integrated states um, where compliance is primarily happening through bundled power purchase agreements or utility-owned projects, um, instead the compliance costs there is, is typically determined um, either by the utility or, or maybe by the Public Utility Commission by comparing the, the cost of those resources uh, be, that are being used for, for compliance with the kind of levelized cost of whatever alternative resource might have been procured um, uh, in the absence of the RPS. So it might be you know, a natural gas combined cycle plant or maybe market prices or some other kind of counterfactual resource. Um, so we've taken kind of data from all of these different states and summarized it here um, as a percentage of average retail electricity bills in each state. And so you can kind of think about this as being a bill impact. Um, I, I would say we, we um, you know, hesitate in really calling it a bill impact. It, figuring out the actual impacts on customer bills is a bit more complicated, but at least in a first order sense, um, you can think about it in those terms. Uh, and so with that kind of bit of, of background and context, you can look at the figure here and see, you know, on average across all of these states, total compliance costs averaged about 4% uh, of, of customer electricity bills. But obviously there's quite a bit of variation from state to state. Um, you can see some of the highest compliance costs are in states um, with um, solar carve-outs. Um, and, and where those carve outs are really the kind of the driving force between those high compliance costs, DC, New Jersey, Massachusetts, uh, Maryland, to some extent. Um, in, in New Jersey and in Massachusetts, as we note on the slide here, those, those uh, carve out costs are associated with legacy programs that are in the process of ramping down, but at least looking kind of historically as we are here, um, those have been really the kind of the primary driver for the overall cost of RPS compliance. Uh, the primary tier shown in green, um, that's where most, most of the megawatt hours are coming from. Um, and those, those compliance costs vary quite a bit from state to state, um, reflecting differences in the target level, differences in rec pricing, um, and differences in, in kind of the structure of how compliance is achieved. Um, you can see in particular that compliance costs tend to be lower in vertically integrated states where compliance is being achieved through bundled power purchase agreements rather than 
primarily through unbundled renewable energy certificates. Um, and at least one reason for that uh, is you know, what, what economists refer to as inframarginal rent, um, or, or put differently, you know, where you're buying uh, or you're purchasing uh, power under a bundled PPA, you can negotiate for the lowest price uh, for that particular resource. Whereas in um, retail choice states where compliance is happening through um, purchase of unbundled renewable energy certificates, those are you know, a commodity and the price of that commodity really reflects kind of the marginal cost of the kind of the most expensive resource on the margin. And so um, that inframarginal rent is then paid for by consumers and that tends to uh, increase compliance costs. Um, here we just show how total compliance costs uh, are evolving over time uh, for the past three years. And you can see um, in some states, those, those compliance costs are going up. Uh, you can see that in particular in PJM states. Um, and that, that incline in compliance costs fundamentally reflects the incline in rec prices in the region that we saw um, on a, a couple slides ago. And so, you know, the fact that, that uh, new builds in the region are, are lagging the growth in uh, RPS targets, not only does that kind of compromise the ability of states to, to meet their targets, but it also raises the cost um, of meeting targets across the region because it, it um, creates this kind of inflationary pressure on, on REC prices. Um, in other parts of the country, you can see RPS compliance costs um, have declined in some states or are remaining relatively flat. Um, in some, to some extent, um, these trends are, are distorted a little bit by the fact that the, the denominator in these percentages, which is the average retail electricity rate or average retail electricity bill, um, that's been going up <laughs> quite a bit as well uh, over the past few years as a result of just increasing utility rates. Um, but but uh, nevertheless, you can see you know, somewhat small changes year over year for, for many of these states. Um, so with that, I'm going to just kind of close things out with a couple parting comments and then we can get to Q&A. Um, so what kind of role or impact might we expect from these programs going forward? And, and there are a couple kind of, I guess, high level signposts or factors that, that we can look out for. Uh, the first is, is whether uh, additional states decide to um, increase their RPS target as, as many states have done over time um, and or to adopt some broader 100% CES target, again, as, as we've seen many states do in recent years. Um, so there certainly is lots of potential for kind of evolution on the policy front in terms of target levels and time frames. Um, Second, you know, the one important uh, factor will be kind of what sorts of implementation enforcement mechanisms ultimately get established for these CES targets. As I mentioned, many of those policies are still in their infancy in terms of fleshing out kind of the, the implementation details. And so it remains to be seen in some cases, you know, what kind of teeth those targets ultimately have. Um, number three, uh, is the spate of recent federal policies, uh, not least of which being the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, these are really critical policies that are you know, transforming the clean energy sector um, and will hopefully help to address um, some of the key constraints and barriers uh, that I mentioned that are, are um, obstacles to, to states achieving their, their RPS targets. Um, or, or obstacles to doing so in a cost-effective manner. Um, and then uh, lastly, I'll just mention um, that, you know, deep in, in the kind of, um, you know, regulatory depths of RPS programs are all sorts of kind of policy minutia that can make a really big difference in terms of how, how these programs actually function. Um, and how effective they are in stimulating new development. Um, that includes things like long-term contracting programs, ACP rates, rules related to the banking of renewable energy certificates, um, eligibility rules, and so forth. And so 
you know, we've seen states as they get gain experience with these policies continue to tinker and continue to refine their their policies in order to address deficiencies um, and to kind of keep up with changes in the market and changes in technology. Um, and so the, the, the degree and manner to which states continue to do that will also be um, quite important to the efficacy of these programs. So with that, um, I think I'm gonna um, open up the, the q and I can see that there have been various folks who have raised their hands and entered in questions. And so I'll, I'll hand the, the microphone over to Eric who has hopefully been queuing those up in, in the background. Yes, uh, there's a bunch of questions. I'm gonna focus on questions that are specific to RPS. There's just there's some questions just about kind of the grid in general. Uh, but to start with one, are you aware of any RPS legislation uh, that includes uh, ways to support decision makings in the communities that host facilities? So they just broadly, does RPS provide any way to help communities that actually support the, the meeting of these mandates? Uh, that, that's a good question. I, mean, I would say so in many states, um, the RPS statute requires some sort of planning process. Um, it's, it's similar to utility integrated resource planning, but it, it is typically a planning process that utilities will conduct every year or every two to three years where they basically identify, you know, what are the, the incremental needs that they need that, that uh, for, for their, under their RPS program, what are the, what's kind of the resource gap and how are they going to fill that gap? And um, often, or at least sometimes through those planning processes, utilities will engage with their communities, with their ratepayers and stakeholders to um, get a sense of, you know, what are the preferences among these affected communities? Um, that, that, I would say, is typically something that is established really through the regulatory requirements more so than through the statute. Um, but, but it is certainly something that, that, that can, and at least in some cases, that does happen. Great. Uh, you point out that rooftop solar generally is not eligible for RPS. Uh, does that change with new business models like virtual power plants and how could those possibly be integrated in RPS? Yeah, potentially. And I should clarify that it's um, it's not always the case that that behind the meter distributed PV doesn't count. In fact, um, one of the reasons why many states developed solar carve outs was to provide kind of a mechanism through which small scale resources could participate and 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 um, sell sell their recs in into the RPS market. So um, it, it really depends on the state and whether there are mechanisms in place. Obviously, if, you know, it's difficult for an individual homeowner or an individual customer to kind of navigate the utility procurement process and figure out how to sell their rec. Um, but, you know, there are brokers that can serve that purpose. Um, and there are programs that have been developed that, that can help to kind of facilitate that. Um, I think VPPs are, are you know, a great example of that. Um, in that case, you've got an entity that's aggregating um, across multiple small customers, and that sort of entity would be in an ideal position to, um, to, to aggregate up and kind of manage the, um, the transaction with, with the utility or, or load-serving entity. Great. Uh, maybe kind of a, a foundational question. Uh, who exactly is obligated to fulfill these RPS requirements? Um, load serve entities, investor owned utilities, and who is exempt? Uh, and specifically, are there any industrial cu customers that play a role in RPS? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, it varies from state to state. I think, I mean, at, at a sort of a general level, typically the obligations are placed on load serving entities. So the the entities who sell electricity to retail customers um, have to demonstrate that at least some minimum percentage of that electricity is coming from renewables or or is is um, or, or is covered by RECs. Um, so that sort of is generally the type of entity who is obligated. Um, but in any given state, there may be certain load-serving entities who are exempt from the standard, and so. 
Um, you know, in general, large investor-owned utilities are, are I, I would say, pretty much always covered um, where, where there is a requirement, but sometimes smaller utilities, um, sometimes municipal utilities or cooperative utilities might be exempt. Um, and you mentioned industrial customers, and, and there are states that allow a load-serving entity to basically subtract a, the portion of their retail load that is being used to meet certain types of industrial customers from their obligation. Um, and in some cases, that might be because those industrial customers are um, purchasing renewable energy themselves independently of the utilities. In other cases, it may be more of kind of an economic development policy where um, you know the you know the um, legislature legislation is you know trying to kind of minimize the any cost burden that might be placed on certain industrial customers. Right. I, I really like this one. So it, it mentions that it seems important that RPS is binding. Uh, and I guess we say it is binding if the recs are more expensive than the alternative pathway. So I guess referring specifically to the, the ACP, the alternative compliance payment. But at the same time, we don't want RPS to cost too much for ratepayers. How do you think about the politics and morality of this trade-off? <laughs> I'm not going to talk about morality here, I don't think. But um yeah, I mean, it is it is definitely a trade off, um, and you know we we see this kind of playing out um, in states where um, rec prices are really low, um, and where load serving entities are having an easy time meeting their target, um, and so in, in cases like that, you know, there can be. Um, you know, stakeholders in, you know, renewable industry or, or other stakeholders who um, say, you know, look, these low prices are a sign that these targets are not really driving the market. We need to raise the target um, in order to effectively raise rec prices so that that um, renewable develop new renewable development is more economical. Um, so, I mean, certainly it, it is a trade-off. Um, you know, you want to drive investment and, and you, the way you do that is providing a compelling financial incentive, but you also need to um, modulate that against costs to ratepayers. And so I think the way that regulators and policymakers try to thread that needle is, is to, to try to develop policies and programs that um, kind of get the biggest bang for the buck. Um, and I and you know I mentioned you know one kind of design choice is the relative reliance on kind of long term bundled contracts versus um, unbundled renewable energy certificates um, in terms of the, the 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 cost that that imposes on on rate payers. Um, so there are ways of threading that needle, but but there is of course at the end of the day some kind of fundamental trade off that has to be made. And following up on that, uh, this is just building on the same question. So this notion that binding RPS requires a high rec price, whatever that means. Uh, but if rec prices are low, but not zero, what do those rec prices mean? And why? Uh, where do those come from? If, if we're saying that the RPS is not binding, it's some people might be skeptical, like, well, this isn't doing anything. Uh, well, then where do the prices go and where does that money end up? Um, I might have, need to ask you to repeat that, Eric, but um, let, let me first just kind of clarify this concept of binding, at least the way that I, I use it and think about it is that RPSs are binding because there is kind of a, pe a penalty or some sort of financial recourse for failing to meet the, the requirement. Um, and in, in many states, that takes the form of an ACP payment. Um, so that's what I mean by binding. But I think, you know, other others, when they use that term, they mean that the policy is is having an effect, uh, is actually driving new new resources. Um, and I think that that's the, the, uh, the, the, the meaning of the term, perhaps, that this, this uh, person has in mind. 
Um, and so, Eric, I'm just going to ask you to repeat the question again, the, the part about when rec prices are, are low. Sure. So, so someone else has put a, a question that'll help me frame this. Uh, why aren't more states replicating the DC model that created a program that values SRECs that are over $400 uh, versus $60 nearby Maryland? And the, the question that I'm asking is there's this intuition that the DC model is somehow better because the RECs are more expensive. So that is apparently doing something um, as opposed to the cheaper RECs in Maryland. And uh, I'm betraying that I, I clearly don't agree with that notion, but I'm curious uh, if, if you think in regard to that question, is the DC model better and should more states be doing implementing models that achieve higher REC prices? Um, so, I mean, I think, first of all, um, I mean, the DC model, DC is a unique case. I mean, it, it's, um, it is, you know, a geographically small uh, jurisdiction. Um, their solar carve out requires that um, resources be cited or inter interconnected to the DC grid. And so there's just a very limited geographical footprint within which eligible resources can be built. And so that kind of unique structural feature of DC has just made it hard to meet the solar carve out. And that has resulted in SREC prices that are at the ACP, which, which is high. Um, now having a high ACP doesn't necessarily mean that you'll have high SREC prices um, as long as there is you know, a sufficient ability for developers to, to build projects. Uh, I think the issue in DC is just that there are these kind of basic structural constraints, not enough rooftops, not enough um, you know, empty lots to, to, to build projects on. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily use DC as a model for, for other states just because it is, is quite unique. Um, but I mean, I think there is, you know, the problem is setting an aggressive target, but not setting ACPs that are high enough to allow the market to meet that target, um, while also not addressing some of the barriers to development that may inhibit new projects from being built. Um, and so I, I think really though, the critical point here is that it's not just about the price signal. It's not just about the ACP or the rec price. It's about addressing kind of all of the other factors that impact the ability of, of developers to build projects, whether that's siting, interconnection, financing, um, you know, those are all critical issues that, that, that need to be addressed um, and simply raising the ACP as a way of letting rec prices float even higher um, may not result in more projects getting built if those underlying barriers aren't, aren't addressed. Yeah, that's, that's where I was hoping you would arrive. Uh, in the voluntary market, rec prices are a very sensitive subject. And uh, I often will point out to people that it's not ultimately about the price. The, the price is a signal of something else. And uh, a Five dollar rec can be as effective as a five hundred dollar rec uh, in a different context. Uh, but there's a there's a segue here about ACPs. So someone's curious if if uh, suppliers are just paying the ACP payment, it doesn't seem like that's adding any renewables. So it seems like the ACP is just a paying a penalty and results in new no renewable energy. So what are the implications of ACPs? Uh, I mean that's that's right sort of. Um as a kind of first order statement. I mean, I, in many states, revenues from ACPs are recycled into kind of customer programs. Um, sometimes they're refunded to rate payers, but often they, they're used to fund rebate programs or other sort of incentive programs that might help um, homeowners or businesses install renewable energy. So um, there is, in some cases, at least some, some new renewable development that occurs as a result of those ACPs. But um, but I think it's it's a it's a good point and a fair point. Um, and um, yeah, I mean ACPs are are there essentially to serve as a cap on rec prices. Um, they're not 
even though they're called an alternative compliance payment, they're, they're not intended to be sort of a long-term avenue for complying with the target. Um, that's not the intent that they were created with. So um, it, it's a temporary, you know, it, it's intended to be um, kind of a safety valve um, that uh, will cap rec prices, but at a level that is sufficient to stimulate new development. Again, kind of contingent on um, any underlying barriers getting addressed. Uh, heading into the last few minutes, this is kind of a big question that you hinted at earlier, but I'll, I'll give you a, a chance to respond again. So a few questions about how much of this growth is really driven by RPS versus the ITC, PTC, uh, load growth, other factors, the IRA. So maybe just unpacking that again, uh, the RPS in interactions with the other factors. Yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll back up to, to that material here. Um, so, I mean, it's, I think as, as I sort of, um, my, my disclaimer before even getting into this material is that it there are all of these other important factors and there are interactions among them. Um, you know, talking about the impact of a particular policy in isolation, um, really it, it kind of doesn't make sense because the efficacy of a particular policy may be um, enhanced or diminished by the presence of other policies um, that are also in place. Um, and, and, you know, it's sort of arbitrary, um, you know, which one you say comes first in the stack. So, um, you know, I would the way I think about it is RPS policies, they create a predictable, stable source of demand. Um, and that that has been important, uh, an important foundation that the industry has been able to build upon and has been, allowed the, 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 the renewable industry to really kind of flourish in other sectors, has allowed the voluntary market to develop in the way that it has, um, has allowed costs to come down and scale to, to come up in ways that have benefited uh, these other other sectors. Um, and so um, it's hard to kind of parse all of that out. You know, what we've done here, you know, it looks like over the past, you know, two decades or so, um, a little under half, 45% of all renewable capacity that's been built is, is being used for RPS compliance. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's a, a number that you can point to um, but that's not a precise attribution in terms of um, kind of the fraction of, of new renewable capacity that can be kind of strictly attributed to, to uh, these policies. Great. Uh, and maybe one final closing question. Uh, the question is asking, which is more successful, the market-based model of Maryland or the contract-based model in New Jersey? I'm not sure exactly what that refers to, but to make it a question, are there differences in RPS beyond just the percentage point uh, in the way they're designed and do those differences matter? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. There are, I mean, um, carve outs and set asides vary from state to state. That's been an important factor in kind of um, supporting the development of kind of more emerging technologies that a state might want to sort of want to become part of its portfolio over the longer term, even if it's um, less competitive with other renewables currently. Um, contracting programs. Um, so even within retail choice states, there have been a whole variety of efforts to develop long-term contracting programs to try to um, sort of diminish the reliance on short-term unbundled certificates. Um, um, so those are just you know two examples of how programs can vary beyond just the target level. Great, and we're at the top of the hour, so I'll let you have the last word. Um, well, um, I think my last word will just be to thank everyone for joining. Um, Eric, thank you for uh, for sitting in the background and helping with the Q&A. Um, again, I'll mention the, the website for the report, rps.lbl.gov. Um, that's where you can go to download the report. Um, that's where we'll be posting a recording of the webinar. Um, and um, if 
any of you have questions that we didn't get to or that occur to you after this webinar, uh, please feel free to, to shoot them my way. Um, always happy to, to dialogue with folks after the fact. So again, thanks everybody for joining and hope to see you next time.